this video, we will cover trusts and future interests as part of our MEE Highly Tested Issues Guide. The first thing you need to be aware of is how trusts and future interests is tested on the MEE. This subject is frequently tested, ranging from twice a year to every two years. It is usually tested on its own and not combined with another subject. However, it has been combined with decedents' estates before. Next, let's turn to the highly tested issues. The examiners tend to test several of the same issues on MEE questions. So by being familiar with them, you can truly maximize your chances of success. Turning to the first issue, validity of a trust. A trust is valid if it has a trustee, a beneficiary, and trust property. Additionally, the person that creates the trust, the settler, must have present intent to create that trust. Now, this is a short and sweet rule statement. No need to memorize anything long and confusing. The next highly tested issues are those of duties of the trustee. A trustee is in a fiduciary relationship with the beneficiaries of the trust. Thus, they have several duties. The first is the duty of care. This requires the trustee to invest and to manage the trust assets as a prudent investor would. Further, when we evaluate the trustee's investments, we cannot evaluate them in isolation, but rather they have to be evaluated in the context of the portfolio as a whole and as part of an investment strategy. The next duty is the duty of loyalty. This requires the trustee to administer the trust solely in the interests of the beneficiaries. This means they cannot engage in self-dealing regarding the trust assets. Courts follow the no further inquiry rule regarding trustees' self-dealing, which says the court will not inquire about the trustee's motivation or the fairness of the action, and they will only seek to determine the measure of damages. This is something the court takes very seriously. The next duty that a trustee has is the duty to allocate property to principal and income. This dictates whether receipts earned during the administration of the trust should be allocated to the principal or the income. Most states have adopted the Uniform Principal and Income Act, or the UPIA, which specifies how receipts should be allocated. The general rule is that ordinary expenses should be allocated to income and extraordinary expenses should be allocated to principal. Further, assets that should be allocated to principal are the money that one receives from a principal asset, life insurance proceeds, eminent domain awards, and all property other than money earned from an entity, as well as distribution of stock. Now, assets allocated to income are things like rental income, interest, and money. The next highly tested topic is the revocability of a trust. Under the Uniform Trust Code, or the UTC, an inter vivos trust is presumed to be revocable, unless the instrument states otherwise. A revocable trust is amendable, even if the instrument does not expressly grant the settlor the power to amend. If a trust is revocable, a settlor may terminate it at any time. If a trust is irrevocable, the settlor may terminate the trust if all beneficiaries are in existence and agree. Now, after the settlor dies, an irrevocable trust can be terminated if both the income beneficiaries and the remainder men unanimously consent, and if there is no material purpose of the trust yet to be performed. These rules make sense because if a trust is irrevocable, we need to make sure that anyone that stands to gain from the instrument agrees to its termination. Next, turning to the common law doctrine of Cypre, which applies to charitable trusts and the ability to modify them. This is now part of the UTC. Under the UTC, if a particular charitable purpose has become unlawful, impracticable, or impossible, no alternative charity is named in the trust, and the court finds that the settlor had a general rather than a specific charitable purpose, then the court may apply this doctrine and direct that the trust property be distributed in a manner that's consistent with the settlor's general charitable intent. So for example, if someone creates a trust where all of their assets were to go to a local animal rescue, but when they die, the animal rescue is no longer in existence, the court could modify the trust so that a new charity would be the beneficiary. Another highly tested issue is the powers of appointment. When someone writes a trust or a will, they can give the beneficiaries the power of appointment. 
This allows the beneficiary to designate who will receive specific trust or estate property. There are two types of powers of appointment. A general appointment provides for an unlimited class of people in favor of whom the beneficiary can exercise the power. So to give you an example, if I give my husband a general power of appointment, it would say something like, you can pick who gets my car. This means that he can pick anyone. He's not limited to a group of people to pick from. Now, a special power of appointment provides for a limited class of people in favor of whom the beneficiary can exercise the appointment. Appointments to impermissible appointees are deemed invalid. So if I give my husband the power of appointment to decide which of our two sons gets my car, this is a special power of appointment because he's limited in who he can choose between. If he chose to give my car to the neighbor, this would be invalid. Our final highly tested topic that we will be discussing in relation to trusts and future interests are different types of trusts. You should be familiar with these because the examiners have tested different types before and they expect examinees to be familiar with them. The first is a pour over will. This is when a will makes a gift to a trust and these are valid so long as the trust is identified in the will and the terms are incorporated in a writing that's executed before or concurrently with the execution of the will. The next is a discretionary trust. This is where the trustee has discretion to decide when to make a distribution to the beneficiary. The beneficiary cannot demand any disbursements. Neither can a creditor except for child support or alimony creditors in some states. So for example, if I create a discretionary trust for my nephew and I make my sister the trustee, she will be able to determine if and when a distribution is made and for how much. A support trust is when the trustee must pay what is necessary for the beneficiary's support. So for example, if I created a support trust for my nephew while he's in college, then the trustee would have to make distributions for things like rent and food or medical bills or anything else that is necessary for his support. The next type of trust is a spendthrift trust. This type of trust restrains both the voluntary and the involuntary transfer of a beneficiary's interest. The only creditors that can reach a beneficiary's distribution before it reaches the beneficiary himself are the following. A child or spousal support creditor, a judgment creditor who has provided services for the protection of a beneficiary's interest in the trust, or the state or federal government, or a creditor with a claim for necessaries, but only a few states recognize that final exception. Finally, a charitable trust. As briefly mentioned in our earlier discussion of Cypre, this is frequently tested on the MEE. To be a charitable trust, the beneficiaries must be a large number of individuals who are not readily identifiable. For example, setting up a charitable trust to create a scholarship for children in the community would be considered a valid charitable trust. So now that we've covered some of the highly tested issues, our next tip is that you should be familiar with the vocabulary. MEE questions will utilize trust-specific vocabulary in its questions. So if you don't understand it, it will be difficult to, of course, answer the question. Additionally, you'll be expected to use the appropriate terms in your response. So it's worth it to review the vocabulary if you're not already familiar. And our final tip is to practice. The best way to be prepared for a trust's MEE question is to practice. And so that wraps up trusts and future interests as part of our MEE Highly Tested Issues Guide.